Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, great to see you all on here today. Join the webinar today on ant control. Um, just wanted to make sure to give a few seconds to to say. Hopefully you can all see me okay, hear me okay, and there are no technical issues. I know the last time we I done a webinar from here, um, there were some sound issues, but I'm quite confident. I've done a bit of work just to make sure keep on top of that. So I'm keeping an eye on the chat for now, but as um, my colleague Kat, who is on it just for technical support, if there's any issues, um, she mentioned in the chat there that any questions that you have, um, to me, please make sure you put it in the Q&A section, not the chat section, because um, after the next few seconds, I won't be looking at the chat section anymore. Um, it would be Kat that would be monitoring that. So any technical problems you have or any questions you have that are not to me, maybe to Kat generally about um, the system, put it into the chat area there and Kat keep an eye on it. Uh, but yeah, any questions um, about the webinar or any questions to me, make sure you put it in the Q&A. Um, I've already got one question that's popped up, so I'll address that um, when we get to it. It's, it's regarding treatment, so I'll, I'll address that when we get to the treatment section, just to keep all flowing nicely. Um, fabulous. So I'm going to get rid of the chat section now. Everyone's saying that everything's OK, so that's fantastic. Um, so, yes, welcome. Thank you um, for joining us today. Uh, just as a bit of a, an interesting um, uh, fact I noticed today is that um, on the 22nd of May last year was the first webinar that the BBCA ever done. So we're almost at that year point. Um, and I think it's it's gone down quite well. I think everybody joining these webinars really um, appreciates that um, difference of um, access to CPD and training. And, you know, it's an hour long. So it, it's always a, just a nice little break during your day. You can just uh, nip out from the, the things you might be doing just to get some updates on things that are going on and, and some technical input such as this AMP webinar today as well. Um, we've got 238 joining us today, so great number, really good number. So it's great. I think with ants, it's that time of year, isn't it, when they are uh, certainly reappearing. I mean, I think some months ago they, they started rearing their heads. So, um, you know, I think this has come at a good time. Um, just for those that are new to the webinar, um, as a reminder, with CBD points, uh, in terms of BBC registered, you get one CBD point. Uh, basis prompt, just check with them. But I do believe that they offer also one point. Um, it's one of the things, because it's an hour long, um, it's, it's interactive in some ways with Q&As, but it's an hour long and generally we say one CBD point per hour of technical training. Um, and also remember, I can't hear you or see you. So um, if you again, if you have any questions, make sure it's on the Q&A section. Um, just ask the question once. I promise I will get to it. Um, obviously, if we get to the end of the presentation and we get close to that, hour mark and I struggle to get through all of the questions, then um, we will extract those out of the end and we'll get the answers out to you. Alternatively, you can get in touch with me on email or telephone and we can have a chat about it um, separately from the webinar, not, not from them at all. Um, OK, so fabulous. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing the screen. It's going to give me five or ten seconds to make sure this uh, works properly. So um, again, if there's any issues, I'll keep an eye on the chat just for um a few seconds to make sure i'm just going to start my presentation for you as you can see it's very colorful so i hope we're all um we're all staying staying well at these um tricky times obviously today was is a, one of the first day really when i think um i say the relaxation of um you know, the, the restrictions in working have, have been released, even though a lot of us have still been, you know, working to, you know, quite high capacity, if not full capacity. But there was some, you know, uh, confusion about what we can and can't do. But today, certainly, I'm assuming a lot more of you are out there and about and um, doing a lot more work, feeling a lot more confident about it. Just as long as you're all staying safe and you're making sure that, you know, you're keeping all of these safety measures, the, the distancing, et cetera, in place, just to make sure you keep yourself and your customers safe. But, Hopefully we're all we're all clear on that. But today's not about COVID-19, it's about ants. So um, I do believe I'm just gonna ask my colleague Kat that we've got the right view here and we can see it properly. Um, and without further ado, haven't seen anything come up. So I do believe you can all see that presentation screen there. Um, going on to the first one. So um ant control then. So per, for pest professionals. As always with these webinars, um, usually the subjects we cover can be, you know, quite involved. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we've only got an hour today, so um, we're going to be going through the 
three main species of ants. I say three main species. Now, this is up for debate on what we... Um, oh, hang on a minute. Kat's just told me to swap view. Okay. Just swapping my view there. Okay. Good. Hopefully you can all see that a bit better. Fabulous. Um, so, yes, the main species in the UK. I did ask a few colleagues, um, you know, on, on what we think would be the, the, the main species to cover, um, because there are there are a few, you know, lots of you out there listening today may have, you know, the ones we're going to cover in detail today may not be the ones that you have mostly come across. But I think, you know, working out those ones that um, um, are most important for you to hear about and for us to discuss today and go through some, you know, a bit of biology, but mostly treatment options, um, the ones that we've selected. We'll do some questions afterwards, we'll do a bit of biology and behaviour, not too much. As I said, we've only got an hour today um, and I'm covering three main species, so we can't go into a massive amount of detail, but certainly, you know, behaviour and the things that might be, or I feel are is important for you to know about the species that helps you to control them. Um, again, more in-depth information, you know, you've got all sorts of technical um, documents, uh, magazines, et cetera, out there that you can go and read and just find out a bit more about them. So I've got through those, we'll have some questions afterwards and then we'll look at control options as well. Of course, I always encourage questions. I think, you know, even if you just want to share something that happened to you or, or you tried recently that worked really, really well. I'm happy to read those things out, share it with everybody just to, um, you know, help, you know, um, in our decision making really on what we do. OK. Um, let me just go through to the first page. So, yeah, the top three, as you can see there, the ones I'm going to focus on more today. So the Black Garden Ant. Um, the invasive garden ant um, certainly might be a new one to some of you, and I think a really important one to consider as well, because there are some important differences. Um, and then the pharaoh's ant, of course, um, most of us, if not all of us, have certainly come across that, a, a tropical ant. Now, the ones that I won't be going into detail today are those four listed below. So the ghost ant, Argentine ant, redwood ant, and the crazy ant. Now, it's just because, as I said, I'm limited on time, not I've chosen those top three ones. But with the ghost ant and the Argentine ant, really, you know, they're, they're tropical ants. They also have a, a similar treatment pattern to, say, what a pharaoh's ant would have. So, you know, you can usually apply the same principles to the treatment of those ants. Um, but any, any any problems you have with you know, redwood ant or crazy ant, you can always call with it your suppliers um, or maybe even, you know, BPCA and we can have a talk and go through any problems you think you might have with those. OK, fab. So, OK, I'm just going to check my chat here. There's a few uh, coming up, just making sure we're still OK. Um, as a group, some people are saying that there's some, oh, shall I move my box here? Is that a bit better there? Can we, I've moved this grey box. Some people are saying there's a bit grey box over the presentation, but I think it should have gone now. Yes, better. Good. Glad I had a look at the chat there. Fabulous. Okay, so black garden ant then. Um, you know, we, we've all we've all dealt with uh, with black garden ants. We know generally how they work, but some some good you know it's good to really remind ourselves on on how they work, why they work, and it gives us a good image of being able to devise a treatment strategy. Um, of course, you know, under favorable condi favorable conditions, nests can persist for several years. You know, the queens and the workers will go into a an overwintering wintering period. So any nests that are reappearing right now, um, you know, just all of a sudden they're exploded in large numbers. And that's because that nest has been overwintering underground, keeping you know away from those um, colder temperatures. They need about 15, 16, maybe 17 degrees to really start to become active again. So as soon as that sun starts popping out, that's when you know the black ants, ants will become active. Um, you know, and they'll continue on, on building their nests. Just as a, a reminder for how um, the um, cycle goes through, of course, usually between uh, June and September, we get that nuptial flight when the uh, queen ants are laid and then hatched. Um, as well as the drones, so the male um, ants, and they have a nuptial flight, so they mate on the wing. And when they do this, you know, it can be really quite um, surprising to 
you know, especially people who haven't seen it before, but even, you know, many of us who have experienced nuptial flights, it's still a fascinating, amazing thing to happen. And, you know, it can be quite intimidating for, for some people. And, um, you know, obviously, because of the nature of it, that nuptial flight where they um, accumulate in large numbers um, on the wing, they, um, they can contaminate, um, especially if they're within buildings. Um, but yeah, so they'll, they'll, they'll mate here. The first lies the queen. The queen will drop straight down to the ground again. The males normally perish very soon after this nuptial flight, um, but the queen will then um, start to look for a suitable area for her to begin a new nest. Now, a lot of the time, these queens, you know, can be many of thousands. Um, you know, not all of them survive. Um, that, that's, that's why they have them in, in such large numbers, because they're not all going to be successful. But the larger the number, the more chance you're going to have success. And that queen is going to go on to building a, a new nest ready to um, start up the next year. And of course, you know, it's a similar process to all ants or, you know, even social insects such as wasp as well, where uh, when she does come out in the spring and starts laying these eggs, she'll stay within the ground. She'll stay there looking after the, ne the eggs. Um, and, the, and the food that was built up in that queen over the, you know, before um, she started overwintering will sustain her through the process of, of laying those eggs and looking after the larvae. So um, and actually, until that nest becomes active enough or the workers are at a number where they can start foraging, that can, queen can lose sort of 50 percent of her, of her body weight. So as soon as they become active, they are very aggressively active and they're out there trying to get proper food sources to feed that queen. Um, as we know, you know, they like a lot of sweet things and um, they feed on, you know, aphids and insects. They're quite beneficial for the garden, really. Um, you know, we, we like to encourage, we'll talk a bit more about that when we get to treatment, but we certainly like to encourage that, you know, they are, when they're in the garden, they're away from sensitive areas, they're, they're beneficial in many ways, um, as, as many social insects are. Um, but certainly when they come into the home, they can become a problem. Um, and of course, they have a, a caste system. So they have obviously the queen and they have workers and drones, they have different um, levels there. And obviously the workers, the females, are the ones that do, do most of the work. They can also live sort of three, four years. Um, and interestingly enough, the queen have, they have been known to live up to 30 years, which is a long time. Um, so yeah, they're, they're very resilient and um, you need to keep going. They are a single queen nest as well. So um, really important to those things. So just a little bit update on how they work and where they're going to be. And of course, they'll they'll be anywhere that's suitable for them, where they can dig down, they can build a nest that's suitable for the size that they need to get to. Um, and you, you can average nest is about four to seven thousand um, in a nest. And, and normally, as I said, they, they won't queens won't occupy one nest. As soon as new queens are made, they'll leave and then try and establish their own colonies. Um, sometimes it can look like a a colony is attached to each other, but it's just because that nuptial flight and the queen landing back down to terra firma will find a nesting site that's quite close to, um, to where she originated from. So it looks like possibly they're connected, but usually they're not. They're quite aggressive with each other and quite territorial. So um, they won't do that. So, yeah, it's yeah, they're, 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 they're interesting insects, but as with them, they, they are beneficial in, in many ways. OK, so the other I don't know how many of you we're going to get to the question time. We might we might see how many of you know you've experienced the invasive garden and um, Latius neglectus. Now, I first came across this probably four or five years ago as a, a member that had a problem with ants and it was very, very widespread, very widespread and very resistant to, um, you know, reducing the numbers in any way. So I wouldn't sort of help them out a little bit. Um, but just just to, um, again, I'll get on to the treatment side of it a bit later on. Um, but it's an invasive garden ant. It was first uh, first discovered um, in Budapest, actually. And it was um, sort of the 1990s and there was an entire neighbourhood um, that was infested with them. And of course, um, the, the, the professor at the time who was dealing with it obviously researched it and and got into that. Um, but the first time we saw them in the UK was in 2009 in a place called Hidcote Manor um, in Gloucestershire. And I know one of our consultant members, um, Clive Bowes, was involved with um, doing a study on them then and trying to get some sort of control program because that was the first major infestation that um, we had come across. It was really important that we understood more about them and also um, you know, tried to do an effective treatment that, that prevented them from spreading across the country. Um, 
I mean, you know, the important things about um, the invasive garden ant and why we don't want them, of course, they're invasive. And um, in terms of their competition with our native species, you generally do not find our native species ant in any area where the invasive garden ant occupies. Um, and also they're very, you know, they're, they do affect beetles and wood lice, they, the populations of them, because again, they're very, they can be very aggressive territorially and um, they do affect the um, sustainability for different insects. So we really don't, we don't, we don't want them in, in the UK. However, recent studies have shown that, um, I say studies, but um, some, some statistics that were given out there by York University was that, um, that they go everywhere from Yorkshire to um, East Sussex, you know, they spread quite a few counties. Um, they are quite hard to identify. You can see the picture on there with uh, Massius niger on the left and Massius neglectus on the right there. The, you know, you can see in that photo, of course, yeah, there's a size difference. But, you know, when you're out there and you're treating, a, um, you know, what you think maybe is a um, black garden ant infestation, whereas that's actually not, it's hard to tell. It's hard, making that identification just by having the, the one insect there can be very tricky. So um, there is an identification sheet available. Um, I'm not sure if that link is, uh, it works anymore, but we do have some contacts at York University and we can always get some more information, but you, you definitely need to get it identified. Um, we do have consultant members that, you know, um, can possibly do that for you. So we, we can address that a bit, a bit later down the line and get in touch with this if you feel like you've got a specimen you need identifying. Um, the other reason they're really important, as I said, they're, you know, the, the first discovery um, in, in Budapest, there were, it was, it was, it was infesting a whole neighbourhood and in Gloucestershire when they were found here, um, they were infesting, it was, it was about um, 14 hectares or 12 hectares, I think, that they were actually infesting. So a very large area, you know, they were uh, around buildings in plant beds um, at the side of arable fields, they were spread out through a massive area. Um, and, you know, the problem with them is, as I said, you know, our native species, they, they have massive effect on them, not just ants, but other beetles and uh, wood lice, etc. cetera. Um, but also they actually can increase the number of, um, for example, aphids, um, and that's because they um, they they use aphids. They they like they cultivate them in a way because the aphids will produce a sh sugary substance that these invasive garden ants like to feed from. So they they will actually harvest them in a way or farm them in a way. But this is also beneficial to the aphids because these invasive garden ants will provide forms of protection for them uh, from ladybirds and such things that, that want to eat the aphids, because of course the aphids benefit the invasive garden ant. Um, so you can actually see an increase sometimes of um, plant damaging aphids or small flies that these ants really love, but of course we really hate and it can have a massive impact on um, you know, horticultural um, and, and, and being able to grow um, plants. Um, one of the, um, you know, because that really is the picture you need to see here is that they cover such a large area. So if you come across a, an ant, a black ant or what you feel is a black ant infestation, but it just seems ridiculously large and covering a, a very, very large area and you feel there's just not something quite right, then maybe it's time to ask yourself, you know, is this the invasive garden ant? Um, and if it is, it does have a slight um, impact on what your treatment strategy would be, and more importantly, what your expectations sh should be. Um, again, I'll go into the, the treatment side of that, but generally it is that when, especially this uh, Hickok Manor when in Gloucestershire, when that was treated, and also, um, you know, and pretty much anywhere else in the world where these ants are found, the main assumption you should have, especially if they're widespread, is that you may only get 90% control. Um, it's very, very hard, if not impossible, to get complete control, especially when they've been established for a long time. Um, now, 2009, this first infestation that was found in the UK, of course, it's the only one that was known of. There may have been more, um, you know, we just, we just weren't aware of. And certainly about five, four, four, five years ago, I was in East Sussex, and that's where this other population of um, invasive garden ants popped up. Um, so all of that time, they, they get transferred around, they can move around, they will, they don't fly, but they actually get transferred around in things like plant pots or building materials. If building work's going on and you're picking up a load of soil from one area and moving it to another, that's how they spread. Um, because the, another important difference, the invasive garden ant compared to the black garden ant 
is that they have multiple queens within their nests. Um, they don't just have one. They do actually get on pretty well. Um, you can have, you know, quite a few thousand queens within a nest and, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of workers. They can be, you know, very large numbers and they can quite easily bud off and create a new nest that's all connected, they're all interconnected, so they live very well together. Um, so they're very, very efficient at growing to very, very large, dense um, colonies. So a real good thing to keep an eye on, you know, and maybe there's a few ant problems you've got now, you think to yourself, yeah, maybe, maybe the, these are the invasive garden ants. Um, and again, we'll get to it in the treatment section of this presentation, but, you know, just, just a, a bit more is, is probably needed for you to be able to address it. Um, you can also find them in, obviously, buildings, um, you know, cavities and um, light sockets is quite, a, plug sockets is quite a common thing. And it's not, they seem to be attracted to the electricity. That's what's reported. But, you know, they're quite happily um, build a nest within there. And if you, you have it for long periods of time, it can, of course, have a detrimental effect on um, the electricity or the, the cavities within and then cause problems. And it can cause damage. Um, but again, um, you know, these are electrical installations. They, they are they do say that they're attracted to them. They do prefer sweet foods, which is great um, because, you know, that allows treatment options to be maybe um, a bit more available. Again, I'll go into that a bit later on. Um, so, yes, really important. And um, I think to yourself, maybe you've come across um, some problems that you're really struggling with. And maybe this is why one of the real actually got to mention the key. Another key identification um, habit that they have that's different to the black garden and um, is their, their um, desire to or the, the fact that they go up and down tree tree stumps. So I mentioned earlier, you know, they feed on um, on, on these flies, but also saps like sweet substances. And obviously you can find these in um, in trees. So they will move up and down these tree stems and you can see sort of tracks of them coming down. Now, black garden ants won't do that. Um, so, yeah, if you, if you see that um, and you've got a, a large area infested, then, then yeah, there's a good chance you've got the invasive garden ant. OK, so they're the two species. Um, yeah, we'll see. I'll probably be about half another section one time. Um, we'll do some questions after talking a bit about pharaoh's ants, just to see if you've got any questions about the individual species. Again, treatment things I will be coming to, but if you've got any questions about um, uh, the ants themselves, great, no problem. Um, again, so pharaoh's ants, quite recognisable. Um, you know, most of us have, have come across them. As we know, they require warm conditions. Their, their name says it really, doesn't it? So it's a tropical ant. Um, they need warm conditions. Usually, you know, between 18, 18 degrees is what they need as a minimum to be successful. Um, and they certainly thrive at anything that's 30 or above. So that's why we we do see them in these warm places. Um, from personal experience, I've had them in, you know, large scale bakeries, um, you know, trailing near to and up and down the side of uh, um, large ovens and certainly on the walls that are connected to them because that heat that's generated from it is, is, is fantastic really for their reproduction. Um, as you can see from there, you know, usually the abdomen is slightly darker than the rest of the body. Um, where something like the ghost ant, they're usually a bit more uniform, a bit more paler in the um, abdomen. So that identification difference you know, can be important. And treatment strategies can be you know, the same. But it's more the labelling of products that you've got to look at. Um, so, yeah, and they've got a quite a well-defined black eye there. So you know, we don't normally have too much of a, a struggle to identify them because of the way they look, um, but also where they're actually going to be. So, you know, we can usually quite easily um, uh, identify those. So they are winged, but there's no evidence that they fly. They can do, but through evolution, there's no need for them to really do that. Um, in, in warmer countries where the temperatures outside are obviously more um, uh, um, suited to them, then they can live outside. But in the UK, we, we don't see them outside. If anybody did, I'd be interested to, to know your thoughts on that, or if, if you have, but never heard of it and no one ever reports on that. Um, so yeah, infestations, they can spread. <laughs> Again, coming on to the treatment side of things, there's some interesting um, bits it's been reading about lately in terms of, of treatment, but the infestations can spread. They're similar um, to invasive garden and they have multiple queens um, and they will bud. They will purposely, sometimes, sometimes they bud or they satellite, they create satellite nests just to, um, you know, because it's beneficial for their population, um, but also they can do it in response to threat. 
Um, if they feel threatened in any way, they can then make the decision to bud and create a, a satellite nest just to make sure that they keep their, their numbers up and their, um, their colony going. Um, you can get up to 100,000 ants, and obviously, you know, quite a few. And, you know, you only, what, what we see trailing down the side of an oven or down, you know, the side of a, uh, um, a tower block, is you know 10% of of the actual numbers of ants that there are you know we we what we see um as pest controllers is normally a very small percentage of actually what ants are um active there so um you know we've got to make sure we get our surveys right um they, they can penetrate so through through plastic bags um we actually can see them you know they, they appear everywhere and um I think one of the most concerns or, or some people experience them in um, steroid, sterile situations in, in hospitals or, or surgical situations. And of course, you know, there's a massive um, public health issue with that. But, you know, penetrating, you know, things like um, uh, needle sacks or, 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 or packaging that these um, sensitive tools are kept in, they can penetrate them and, and uh, cause a problem. Um, they are omnivorous, you know, they'll feed on meat, cheeses, fats, you know, anything sugary or, or honey. Um, but in hospitals, they also feed on things like blood and intravenous diet fluids. It's pretty pretty nasty, really, um, and, and fluid associated with wounds and vomit. So, yeah, uh, and pretty much anything that they come across, but they certainly prefer those things. And, and this is why they pose a risk to health. Um, you know, pathogenic organisms can be transmitted mechanically as the ants um, feed on in high, unhygienic places such as drains or refuse and bins and wombs, of course. So, um, so yeah, they're going to possibly spread these around um, mechanically, you know, through their through their movement. So yeah, um, it, it's a real concern. You know, we don't we don't want them. Obviously, food risk as well, contaminating foods that might be um, in production. Um, so yeah, it's, it's good to hear if you, any of you got your, your stories that you've got associated pharaohs ants and the best work can come onto the treatment. You might have some novel ways that you've, you've dealt with them. Um, but yeah, so we're going to go on to some questions. Um, we've been going half an hour now already. Um, so I can see we've got a few popped up. I'm going to bring my Q and A box over to the main screen. So it's probably out the way of yours. Okay, um, so yes, I've got a treatment question here, just at, right at the top. I'm, I'm going to address that anyway in the next section um, of, of treatment strategies. Um, so um, we'll come up to that. Um, okay, so I've not signed up anywhere from so my CPD points. How do I do that? We'll we'll get your um, CPD point. I think Kat can answer that for you in the chat, but certainly once the session has finished, then you can get in touch with, if you go onto our website, you can go on to um, contact information and it'd be um, Katrina, you can talk to her about getting your CPD points logged. Um, if it's BPCA registered, there's a few ways you can do it. And if your basis prompt, um, the best way is to um, speak to basis prompt and um, see how you can log your points with them. Uh, okay, so can we print notes after the webinar? Um, with the webinar will be available um, online, so as you see it now, um, it's recorded, so you can certainly go and view old webinars as we've got, you know, for the last year we've, you know, done nine or ten webinars and all of them you can view as well as this one afterwards. So there aren't any notes as such, but you can download the webinar again and, and watch it again. That's no problem. Um, okay, so lastly, is that a lockdown haircut? Do you know what? I can't see myself at the minute. So hang on a minute. Let me. Uh, do I need to sort myself out? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> um, no. It, well, let's say lockdown haircut. We've had no haircuts. I'm all going grey more than anything. But hey, aren't we all? Um, yes. Thank you for that, David. Um, <laughs> okay. So hi, Nancy. Which are the best methods or insecticides to deal with ants in both commercial and domestic? So I'll go into that one in a moment. Matthias, um, I am still going to come on to treatments just afterwards. Um, and then we've got some more questions at the end. And just in case I haven't got to answer these uh, questions you've got, I'll, I'll come to them then. But I don't, I don't want to repeat myself too much. Happens quite a lot. OK, so uh, you're getting grey boxes. I think we've got rid of that problem. Ghost ants are big on sugar. Same treatment as pharaohs. Again, I'll, I'll come on to that. But yeah, ghost ants are, I know some products, they are mentioned on labels. Um, so yeah, you, you know, if they're mentioned on a label, follow the instructions and you can use them for ghost ants, absolutely. Um, hi there, will you be covering 
on how to treat effectively carpenter ants. I won't, um, unfortunately, today. I, as I said, very limited on time, but um, Albert, if, there, if there's something you want to discuss, either you give your suppliers a call or you can give us a call or an email if you've got particular questions, no problem. As I said, there's quite a few species we deal with, but um, you know, we just uh, struggle to cover all of them. Um, okay, so although the different ants have varied behaviour, would a three month programme be successful at controlling them? I mean, uh, that, that's a, a very wide question. It depends on the species. Um, of, of ant that you've got. I know certainly other old products that we used to use, they, they, could, they could take months. Normally Pharaoh's ants, it's a, a growth regulator. They, it can take some time, um, whereas more modern gels and things that we're using can be a bit quicker. But I'm at, at risk of going into treatment um, right now, just during this first question bit, I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully come on to that. But you can ask that question again at the end if you feel um, you have, haven't answered it. Um, uh, are invasive ants also known as brown ants? No, the different species, brown ants, um, they're Lassius brunus. I should remember that scientific name. Um, no, they, they are a different species. Um, brown ants, I don't come across as much. Generally, brown ants are, you know, they tend to keep away from where we are. They're normally in the woodlands under sort of rotting woods and by trees and et cetera. So we don't normally come across them too much. If we do, um, I don't know if there, we have any products really that are, you know, authorised to, to treat um, Lassius brunus, but um, no, I'm, invasive ants, no, they're not, not the same as a brown ant, it's certainly a different one. Okay, uh, will the invasive garden ants try to get honey from a beehive? No, that um, certainly bees will uh, be more aggressive. The thing with um, invasive garden ants, they don't actually um, they don't spray formic acid and they don't have a sting. So um, they don't have great defensive mechanisms, although they are quite um, uh, territorial and aggressive with other ant species and, and calling insects, but certainly with bees. Um, and I have now, this is my common sense coming out here. I haven't read anything particular on, you know, a study of, of invasive garden ants, bee, honey bees, but uh, my, my instinct and, and common sense would say that, that no. Um, I mean, if it was a redundant um, beehive and there was uh, honey there, I don't see why not. Um, so that could be a possibility. OK, just a couple more questions and then we'll uh, we'll move on. Um, Natalie, aside from appearance, particularly size, are there any behavioural habits or hints that can help distinguish the invasive from the black? It's um, I, would, I would go back on my um, presentation there, but the you know the side by side view or the 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 image that we have there of the um invasive and the black garden ant together the size difference albeit it's quite it's not a massive size difference but there is a you know the, the invasive garden ant is a little bit smaller but they are so similar in color sometimes they're slightly not quite as black in color slightly browner but really to the naked eye when you've got them there in front of you it is very difficult I mean I, I certain I can um, identify this issue we had um, some years ago near, uh, near, near uh, the East Sussex it was um, sort of Brighton way um, you know we had to send them off to to an entomologist to get identified which they confirmed that yeah they were invasive garden ants um, so yeah that 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 looking at them when you've got them in front of you is very tricky um, I think the best thing to go on is, is, as I said, you know, looking at the size of the infestation, looking at, you know, where they are. So if you're seeing them going up, up tree stumps, um, you know, feeding on these aphids, and if you're getting them in cavities and around light sockets and electrical installations and things like that quite a lot, that will build a really good picture. And then maybe it's just that last thing you need to do, that identification um, getting them sent off. Now, York University, I know, are involved with a lot of studies. They've actually done an article. It was a couple of years ago. I think it was PPC87, I think, um, back in 2017. They've done an article in invasive garden ants. So they've been studying them a little bit. Um, and they were saying that if you were if you collect at least five samples from different areas of, of the actual ant themselves, um, then they're, they're happy to identify them. Now, I hope that offer still stands. We, we can still do that. Maybe we can look into that a little bit more. Um, but also our consultant members, you know, a lot of them are entomologists and they can, you know, give, supply you with a service of identifying certain species or maybe even your suppliers as well. But I, I do think if you if you really think to yourself, actually, I think I've got invasive garden ants here. 
um, collect those five samples um, from different areas and get them sent off in the best condition that you can so that they can get identified and you know you can establish it because they also I mean I have been doing a bit of research on um, the non-native species secretor which um, in the article that York University mentioned that they would be producing sort of guidance on on the ant to gardeners and also they're a reportable pest um, I couldn't find too much recently um, however I, you know, I really do still believe if you if you do find a population of garden ants, maybe uh, sorry, invasive garden ants, um, pop the information over to me, and I'll be happy to you know pass it on and, and maybe see if there is anybody that's interested in monitoring these numbers. Because um, although you know it's in 2009, there was you know a real effort to try and reduce the spread of them. Obviously, um, you know they're being found around most of the UK now, um, and I didn't mention before, but it's actually. I mentioned that, you know, from the movement of plants and things around certain estates or areas can spread problems. But also if you're buying plant pots from a, um, a garden centre and there's a, a residual number of these invasive garden ants in there and you're transferring them um, to your garden, you, you know, might be 10 miles away, 100 miles away. Of course, you're moving that infestation and creating a new population. So that's how I think it's, it's spread around the UK through just, just our, our activities. Um, they're very resilient. So that's how we rely on, on increasing their numbers. Um, OK, so I'm quite a few more questions come in now. So I'm going to get on with the treatment side of things. And then what I'll do at the end is I'll spend the rest of whatever time we have left trying to do the questions. Anything I don't get to, um, like I said before, I will try my best um, to get that done. Um, OK, so I'm going to get rid of these boxes on here so you can't see them. There we go. Right. Hopefully you can all see the screen. OK. Onwards and upwards. Great. Hopefully this is being useful. As I said, it's I don't like to rush through things too much. And I want to I want to cover the good behavioural biology points I think might help you. Um, but yeah, we are limited on time. So we're limited on on the amount of detail that, that I can go into. And um, it's amazing how quickly time goes when I'm babbling on. Um, OK, so treatment options destruction of the nest so is key now there's a common theme through this I think we might not be on the the treatment side of things for too long I'll possibly leave you know most of the time to questions I think that'd be most useful but um you know gel baits are an amazing thing and really generally these days whatever species you come across you know we we, we tend to have a favorite way of dealing with them but the key thing to do is obviously identify your species because that is what's going to allow you to put the the treatment option that you've chosen gel bait spray whatever it might be in the right place um, in the right quantities and also that you're, you're you're doing the right amount of visits to it the right amount of follow-ups and keeping an eye on it for as long as you should to be able to get that effective control um, so yeah generally it's, it's going to look the same across the board but let, let's see see how we go with it but as always, when I talk about treatments or chemicals or anything like that, um, we've got to remember, you know, safety and the product you're using and that you're selecting them um, regarding, you know, formulation of toxicity. Now, the really good thing with, um, I'm kind of going to be talking about gel baits a lot, of course, um, when we bring it up. And, and, and as an example, in terms of safety, and one of the, the benefits of gel baits that we maybe don't think about um, as much is is you know for the user so your employees or yourself when you're using you know a gel bait you think of the PPE you need compared to PPE for doing a um, a residual spray treatment you know they're very different you know you need a lot less for gel baits it's a lot safer for you 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 know the mechanism of how you apply it takes you away from that active ingredient it takes that risk or lowers that risk a lot more than it does compared to when you're using insecticide treatment. So although also gel baits would be considered possibly much more effective, they're actually a lot safer as well for you and you know your customer um, because the places that we can put them, you know, we can get them out of the way, we can make them safe, we can make them, you know, so that um, they can't tamper with them. So yeah, really, really good thing to think about is that that safety for you and your customers in terms of what you're using. Um, and of course, toxicity and formulations. Um, there's quite a few products out there now that you can use. And again, talking about 
gel baits um, they work some of them work in slightly different ways you know some of them are a lot more delayed or some may have um, particular safety features which i'll talk about in a moment that are beneficial um, you know always do your risk assessment I'm not saying you need to do risk assessments or cost assessments on every single one job that you go to you know you might be doing five or six in a day but as long as you've got a, a, a general overview of, of how you're going to approach them and you know always make a note on your treatment reports as well so I recommend any job you go to you know just notice any risks um, if there's anyone particularly vulnerable obviously make sure you you know uh, manipulate your treatment process to allow for that and then keep people safe that's the most important thing um and yeah and follow those label conditions i'm not going to mention trade names today um it's not you know uh in in, in benefit but certainly formulations um and active ingredients that come in and different different people supply different things feature suppliers and manufacturers of course about specific products but um you know always follow the label conditions make sure the pest species is mentioned so you know invasive garden ant just check that, that they're mentioned on there um, and just follow all the instruction, you know, whether you can use it inside or outside or maybe both. Just, just make sure you look at that. Don't assume, oh, it says gel bait for ants. I can use it for everything. You know, just make sure you, you read that. Really important. OK, so um, only a few more slides. As I said, it's, it's going to be quite similar across the board. Um, Black garden ant. Uh, if you've got specific questions because I'm sure what I'm going to go through now is kind of you know obvious stuff it's just really a reminder and to get you thinking about the different things that you could use and also questions that you might have and maybe even research that you'll go and do after this um, but yeah black lines can you leave them alone of course it's a you know sometimes you might feel it's a business decision to deal with them but you know very rarely people will call you anyway if they've just got some ants down the end of their garden or on their patio um you know if they call you and they say that's the problem then maybe it's something you decide to you know leave them alone and just advise them on their benefits um they're actually good aphid controls and they can pollinate as well the natural movement through the plants and um collecting that nectar can actually pollinate plants as well so yeah just consider that um non-toxic options um i don't know what i'd consider non-toxic anymore of course you know diatomaceous earth or silicon dust things like that we consider non-toxic and maybe in a chemical term they are but they do still have some you know we don't want to be breathing that stuff in so you still need to protect yourself with it um but yeah maybe look at that you know some um if you're working inside say for example a kitchen where you're, you're putting some ants coming in maybe you can you know just to reduce the numbers a bit quicker or, or to get that control that um will will uh, you know help out that customer at that time you know it's non-toxic formulations that you could use to to reduce the numbers in the safest way this is all cost hierarchy really just consider it just have a look at the products you've got that that toxic um or active ingredient level um is good to have a look at um we mentioned insecticidal sprays um and i do remember a time when there weren't gel baits for black garden ants um vaguely um, early 2000s probably um and you know spraying was quite a, a regular thing and you know it wasn't it was very rarely um that effective and it's, it's mostly because what we need to get this is the overall treatment strategy for ants is that you need to get to the whole of the nest you need to get to the queen slash queens um and the, and the worker ants you need to control them as a whole as we mentioned you know the ones that we see crawling out and about that we might be spraying it's going to have very little effect on the long-term control because you know that nest within um the cavity or or the or the ground structure is, is not going to be effective and it will recover very quickly um you know possibly if you find certain holes that you feel are leading to a nest you know, you might want to inject some uh, insecticidal spray there, of course, if it's on the label, you can do so. Um, but again, you know, it's a very hit and miss. You know, you can't really, unless you start digging things up or pulling things out, you don't really know where those tunnels go or how they connect. So not always great, but it can be a, a good thing to just, for example, you've got a sensitive area, you've got ants coming in um, and you want to reduce the numbers quickly in that area where they're very sensitive, yes. An insecticidal spray would be great for that, of course, and um, it would knock them down a lot quicker because gel baits can take a bit longer. Um, and then, said with you know gel baits, 
got different formulations. It might be Indoxacarb or Fipronol or Madoclopid. We all have our favourites or, it, you know, whether it's cost related or you just find one is a lot better for you than another. Um, I know um, certain actors out there, I think Indoxacarb particularly, um, is quite long lasting. It lasts for a long time. And quite an interesting element about Indoxacarb is that um, it doesn't actually become toxic until it's ingested by that insect. So, you know, if we go back to, you know, looking at the cost hierarchy or, or safety side of things, you know, maybe if you're in an area where you feel, you know, it could be, you know, it could be in contact um, or, you know, there's uh, children or you might be in an area where, um, you know, there might even be a, a mental health facility where, you know, you, you're not sure in the, the activities of, of of the people there and then what they might do and you're worried about them coming into contact with it and of course you'll use various devices to try and make sure they don't and put it in areas out the way but yeah and doxycarb it's got that that because it's not toxic until it's ingested by that insect it's a pretty good safe safe product never used it myself i haven't had the opportunity to but i've had you know good reports on it but each of you will find different results i'm not going to say you know, one thing is better over another because it will vary. It's like anything, you know, whether you're dealing with rodents or, or insects, each person in each area of the country will have different experiences. Um, the important thing is, is whatever you do use is that you, you follow the label conditions in terms of how much you're supposed to put down. Now, I've been to quite a few um, ant um surveys or, or or jobs should I say over the over the years not doing them myself just by helping members or observing and I would say eight times out of ten you know the the application can be the problem or the reason why control is not uh, gained quickly or quickly enough is because you know either very 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 small amounts are being put in lots of different locations or very large amounts are being put in just a few locations. You know, you've got to follow those labels and what it says. They've done the scientific studies. They know, you know, how much you need to put down, how often in what spread. Um, and also your follow ups. You need to, to make sure you follow that. It's tempting just to go around and, and blobbing it around, you know, and getting on with your day. But, you know, you really need to take take in because that will reduce your visits in the long run. Um, and it will make sure that those ants get enough product to be able to take it back to the nest and, and destroy the nest completely. So, yeah, gel bait seem easy, but just just, you know, make sure you concentrate on what you're doing and, and, and how you're using it, because that, that's usually the treatment of failure in terms of black ants. OK, right. Um, so invasive garden ants. There's not going to be much difference in terms of treatment. In terms of product, you know, I'm not going to carry on whittling on about fipronil and madocoprid and lots of carb gels and you know what uh, what ones you want to use because you know they're there, you can use them. The important thing is that you identify firstly whether it's an invasive garden ant or not. And I mentioned before that it's because you need to manage your own expectation as well as your customers because if they are an invasive garden ant and they're spread through a wide area. Um, the control is going to be possibly not 100% and it possibly never will be or it will take some time. So you as a business, you need to take that into account um, because, you know, you, you quote for a, a black garden ant job and you go and do one or two visits or whatever it is that you do. Um, and then, you know, three months down the line, you think, course, I'm still getting callbacks for this. And, you know, you might have business as well as professional um, problems or concerns there. Um, so. So really important the UID, uh, maybe establish a relationship, whether it's with a supplier or a consultant member of ours. Um, I, we certainly can't identify the difference between the invasive. We don't have the tools um, um, to do that. Um, we certainly recommend using an entomologist to identify the difference between the, the black guard and that. Now, again, you know, the activity, you might come to us and say, oh, well, Natalie, and give me an example. And I may say to you, blimey, yeah, that really does sound like the invasive garden and but I would still encourage that you know, definite ID of it so that you can be 100%, you can go, right, this is it, okay, and have a real, you know, plan ahead. Um, and, and that plan really is survey. So it's really important that you, um, you know, survey the infestation, you put different monitoring devices out. Now, you know, whether it's blunder traps um, would probably be a good idea, you know, collect and obviously if you're catching these in many different areas, you can use that as your identification tool. Um, also, you can you can gauge the scale of it and then you can make sure 
um, your treatment strategy, normally gel baits. Again, check the label with the gel baits because I was looking at one today um, and it didn't, it, it had the scientific names on there as well. Um, but, it, you know, it's Black Garden Ant, Fairies Ant, Ghost Ant, um, possibly one other ant. Um, but yeah, Invasive Garden Ants wasn't on there. Um, uh, Lassius uh, Neglectus wasn't on there. So yeah, make sure obviously you, you've got a product that, that is authorised for that. If you're not sure, speak to your suppliers. But yeah, get it, get, having, a, having a, um, an overall image or view of how far the infestation spreads will obviously get you, give you an idea of right how much product you need to use, where you need to put it. Um, and your follow-up treatments as well, because you know if you're if you're treating a localized issue, but you've actually got you know um, satellite colonies, you know scattered around all around you that you haven't noticed, it's going to do absolutely nothing for the numbers. Really, it might reduce them by a very small amount um, to begin with, but um, generally it won't. There was a really good study I mentioned in 2009, the Hidcock Manor. Um, Clive Bones wrote a paper on it um it's a four five six pages long it's, it's not um too long it's a really good read and actually it gives you a real insight into what they've done what they experienced um and that can help you form um possibly something going forward as well it's available online um i'm sure clive would be happy to share it um i'll just you know i'll probably ask him to you know just in anticipation that some of you might ask us for it i'll see if that we, we can share it but it's a really good read um it doesn't give you a lot of detail on the treatment strategy there is some in there um, but you know, it really was. It's relatively straightforward. You you know, you can use gels. It's fine. You've just got to, as long as it's on the label, you've just got to make sure that you're putting it as widespread as you need to, and also that your expectation is not necessarily a hundred percent control. And then talking that through with your customers, um, you know, benefit for you to do that. Again, insecticidal sprays you can use, similar to with garden ants. You know, if you you know you need to reduce numbers quickly in a sensitive area. Um, it's a good thing to do to um, certainly make sure, um, you know, those, those, those um, ants are not going to infest any sensitive, you know, sort of food supplies or chains or um, medical sterile areas. So, yeah, you can certainly, certainly do that. Um, so, yeah, quite, quite a, a theme across, across here is it? it's just, you know, finding out what the, what the scale of the infestation is. Um, okay, um, going on to pharaoh's ants, blimey, I've only got eight minutes left. So uh, with pharaoh's ants, again, if we if we do struggle for time, then please do contact me about any any um, situation you want to discuss specifically. Um, but with pharaoh's ants, as we mentioned before, you know, surveys must be conducted to determine the extent of the infestation. Um, you know, these should always involve sort of visual assessments and the collection of information, you know, because again, what you see climbing down that wall is not, you know, is always a very small percentage of actually what's going on or how many nests there might be. Um, you know, they spread very easily. Now, you know, we say we should not use sprays. We should not spray for pharaoh's ants. Now, the reason for that is because I mentioned before, um, if they are, if they have a, they have a, a, a fear reaction, a, a danger reaction. If something um, triggers them to um, to be fearful or, or that they're in danger, then they will bud and they'll create satellite uh, colonies, which we don't want because that's spreading the infestation. Um, however, you know that's if it's close by. If you if you you know have some activity and you have a very sensitive area, you know, I mentioned before they can be in sterile environments, you know, where there's a very high risk of contamination. You know, using a quick knockdown spray to get rid of those numbers is not something you should dismiss. Um, you know, you certainly can do it. It's, 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 we don't necessarily know where the nests are. And it's that um, if you spray too close to where a nest may be or a queen is, that will that will um, activate this defense system. And that's when they'll, they'll disperse. But, you know, in theory, if you're far enough away from it, it shouldn't cause that dispersal. But also, if you need to do it because it's in an area that is particularly sensitive, maybe you need to do it. Um, again, a case by case situation. Um, we've done an article actually on Pharaoh's ants as well in PPC. I think it was in, um, it was last year. So 88, something like that, maybe um, 92. Yeah, one of them. Um, but yeah, if you go onto our website, so it's Pharaoh's ants, it'll probably come up with the article um, that I wrote. And the reason I'm telling you this is because we are running out of time a little bit. And it is a, you know, a good read. It gives you some more details about um, products. But we specifically... 
um, sort of talk about the esmethoprene, the juvenile hormone, um, the insect growth regulator that um, you know affects most, you know, sterilizes the queen and prevents larvae from developing. Um, they naturally die off at the end of their natural life cycle or span. But you know, that's what cycle that span is up to like 12 weeks. So you know, if you're putting in a treatment um, with a, a growth regulator, they're great, they're fantastic. They just take quite a lot of time to work. Now that's all we used to have really for ferrozans, whereas you know the modern-ish um, and the slow-ish acting poisons such as imidacloprid and, and such things, they're, they're weeks rather than months they take to work for ferrozans. So they can be great, just got to make sure that you know where you're using them, obviously if they're um, you know they're safe and you're not just, I've seen you know gels being squirted in on walls and it running down before and yeah. Um, you know, just think about where, you, where you're placing that. But really similar treatment to, to Black Garden Ants. You know, you've got to get it in the right place and spread out to the areas where it needs to be. Usually you want to work from where an infestation, um, the boundary of it, and work your way in and treat it that. So that's why it's really important to get that, um, that sense of boundary of where they are, where they extend to, and, and surveys is the way forward. And you know, all these things will make you think about, you know, your, your quoting or the way that you approach um, you know, given information to customers and how you're dealing with things and what they can expect and and of course costing that that you want to apply to it um so yes we've only got a few minutes left and there are 30 questions or so um just uh, just wanted to go through a few reminders you know we've got uh, um, a regional forum next week that um oh, let me just bring my screen over here okay yeah so we've got a regional forum next week which will be starts at um, 9 a.m half 9 a.m um going through for three hours and we've got various presentations on there and it's just a you know we're trying to get our regional forums that we used to do face-to-face -face venues um online so that you can still get that interaction with suppliers um can ask questions and, and a variety of presentations not just me um bubbling on at you um for for an hour so let me um just go on to some questions as i said i've we have got 33 questions on here and i do apologize we, we certainly aren't gonna be able to get through all of them um so okay i'm going to go so would what would the best ant treatment between gel and granules now granules are normally going to be the insect growth regulator and as i mentioned um, before they're usually a lot slower acting they are just as effective they're they're great once they start working they are fantastic it's just that time scale that's the main difference um you know so so that's the thing you've got to got to consider in terms of that formulation or active ingredient is that the time scale that it takes um everyone has their preference okay so um hi Natalie, which are the best methods or insecticides to deal with ants in both commercial and domestic kitchens to minimize the risk of hazardous chemicals around foods? Great question. Yeah, um, again, speak to your suppliers and um, um, your, the manufacturers. But yeah, you know, if you can find anything that might be um, immobilizing, I think some of these immobilizing um, uh, products that have been developed that encase the insect, I'm not sure if they're authorized for ants or not, might be worth having a look at. You know, diatoms, diatomaceous earths, liquid dust, things like that you could use. Obviously, some will be um, not as, as quickly acting as others. So that's when you maybe start looking at the um, the products that um, attack the nervous system. They, they, they affect the ions and the communication between them. So therefore affects the nervous system, usually a bit of a quicker um, kill rate. So, um, you know, look at those look at the labels, look at the MSDS sheets and just do your own cosh assessment on them. But I don't, I, I'm not gonna recommend to you now any particular insecticide, um, uh, you know, trade name or, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're all pretty much work, uh, for, in my opinion, as good as each other. Just, you've got to, you're, you know, your own situation, kitchen or otherwise, you've got to make sure you're using the least toxic. So just go through that hierarchy. Um, Okay, we've got one minute left. Solo, one more question. Um, I have noted of late that gel bait treatments for fair ants have been fairly non-effective. Has there been a major change to feeding habits, or do you think it could be environmental issues? It could be. It it could be. Um, you know, application as well. I mean, I don't. You know, a lot. Most failed pest treatments is due to 
bad application. I don't like using that word bad application. You know, we can all, you know, rush things sometimes or maybe not get it quite right or not know that extent. You know, I mentioned before the the extent of an infestation, you've got to you've got to have a good view of that. Because if you don't, you'll be treating this small area here. Oh, well, yeah, I'm getting all these ants here, but actually, you know, there's other satellite, you know, colonies out here that you're not treating. And you know, a few weeks down the line, they start then taking over that area again, and you've got a problem, and you feel that there's some some issue with the product. But a lot of the time, it's you know that survey and the application. Um, application of it now i'm really really sorry everybody i'm gonna have to um uh, finish the webinar there i think i'm one minute over so um I'll get told off but i really really appreciate you all joining us um give us a call give us an email if you've got any questions if you want us to do any a webinar on any specific um ant species or insect species then please let us know because you know we do like to try and keep things um you know is beneficial uh, in terms of the variety of things we're covering but if you do have you know I've done a bed bug one not not so long ago that was very specific it's quite a big subject so if there's any other insect species that you want us to cover in more detail in one hour you know solely in that one hour then um, we will do that whether it's myself or a different uh, colleague or um, BPCA member maybe even that has you know particular ex expertise in those areas we can always find that we will um, but yeah just let us know if there's any particular um, species you want us to cover otherwise just give us a call email and yeah we'll talk to you um, separately independently okay great well thank you everybody for attending and uh, stay safe and well and I'm sure we'll see you soon